We are going through a series entitled uh, Bible's Bad Guys, looking into the looking into the life of some of the not so good lives in the Bible, but the Spirit of God has given space in His Holy Word to record the lives of those people also, lives that are not so good, trying to see what the Lord has to tell us through these lives. And today is the ninth sermon in the series entitled, Bible's Bad Guys. Here is a quote from the world's richest preacher. Do you want a hundredfold return on your money? Give and let God multiply it back to you. No bank in the world offers this kind of a return. Praise be to our God. And he is the world's richest preacher, whose name I will not mention, whose net worth is 780 million US dollars. Another quote, and this is from the wife of this man. She, in her book, quotes Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 29 and 30, which reads, No one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or feels for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. And then she gives her explanation for this particular verse. Give ten dollars and receive thousand dollars. Give thousand dollars and receive one lakh one hundred thousand dollars. In short, Mark 1030 is a very good deal with God. Another popular preacher, I quote again, it is God's will for you to live in prosperity instead of poverty. It is God's will for you to pay all your bills and never to be in debt. The sad state of lying tongues in the Christian world. And today's character, the ninth character, is about a man who long, long ago established this trend of being a messenger of God but daring to be a messenger of God with a lying tongue. The ninth character in our series of Bible's bad guys is Hananiah, a messenger with a lying tongue, whose record is there in the Holy Bible in Jeremiah chapter 28. Jeremiah chapter 28. Hananiah, a messenger with a lying tongue. The 28th chapter of the book of Jeremiah, we will find the record of this man about whom we are studying today. Hananiah. That in God's Wisdom, this man's life is placed in the 28th chapter of the book of Jeremiah because in the 27th chapter of the book of Jeremiah, you have a message from God. That is chapter 27. But in the very next chapter, that is chapter 28, you have a message from man. 
So it is placed one after the other. It's almost like uh, you know, two sides. On the one side, you have the message from God, where the main person is Jeremiah himself. That is chapter 27. But in chapter 28, you have the message of man, where the main person is a man whose name was Hananiah. Now, the, this is very important because uh, to be a prophet in the Old Testament is never a very easy thing. It's a very challenging thing. One of the, one of the things that prophets have to do is they must be object lessons for the message that they carry. Sometimes they have to embody the message that they speak. It's not only an oral ministry, it is also a living ministry. They have to embody the message. That's a very tough task. Uh, prophets have to lie on one side for close to uh, 300 days. Uh, prophets have to uh, cook food using cow dung and eat it before people. Uh, prophets have to dig through the hole and escape in the night. Uh, these are all object lessons. The, the, the point is prophets not only speak, they actually embody the message they, have to, they are speaking. It's a very, very tough task, you know. If uh, many of our uh, today's uh, you know, easy-going prophets, as we see in televisions and everywhere, uh, lived in the Old Testament days, none of them dared to become prophets. They are only prophets today because there are televisions to um, uh, you know, relay their programs or whatever it is. None of them, not even one of these fellows would have been prophets if they were living in the Old Testament days. They would dare not. It was such a difficult task to be a prophet. So here in the 27th chapter of Jeremiah, God tells Jeremiah to embody a particular message. He ministered in the nation for 54 long years. And this is another problem with lying tongue people. You know, those who really speak the message of God, they labor for 54 years. Now, more than half century, and all that it takes is one day for the lying tongue fellow to come and take everything and go. Uh, I think Jeremiah had that disappointment. It was 54 long years of labor in the land of Judah. And here comes one fellow with a lying tongue, and he just carries people along with him, just through a false message. And that's always been the problem with those who have lying tongues, messengers of God, but have tongues of lying. They have their ways often very easy. And those who really speak the truth have real disappointment, disappointing time. Jeremiah was embodying a message in the 27th chapter that he was asked by God to take a wooden yoke on his shoulders. And then Carrying the wooden yoke on the shoulders, Jeremiah had to walk through the streets of Jerusalem. And when people ask him, why are you just carrying a wooden yoke and walking on the street? Jeremiah had to tell them, God is sending Nebuchadnezzar nature. He is going to be the wooden yoke for the nation Judah. And the message is this, when God is putting you under a yoke, stay under that yoke. The point is very simple. Nebuchadnezzar's nature will be a burden, but Judah should not try to escape that burden. Judah must submit to that burden of Nebuchadnezzar's nature. That was chapter 27. Let's read a few uh, verses there. 27th chapter, reading from verse 1. The time is around 596 BC. Uh, let's read verse two, chapter 27 of Jeremiah, verse 1 onwards. In the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, the king of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Thus the Lord said to me, Make yourself straps and yoke bars and put them on your neck. Send word to the king of Edom, the king of Moab, the king of Sons, Ammon, the king of Tyre, and the king of Sidon by the hand of the envoys have come to Jerusalem to Zedekiah, king of Judah. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, this is what you shall say to your masters. It is I who by my great power and by outstretched arm have made the earth with the men and animals that are on the earth and I give it to whomever it seems right to me. Now 
I have given all these lands into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. And I have given him also the beasts of the field to serve him. All the nations shall serve him and his son and his grandson until the time of his own land comes. Then many nations and many kings shall make them their slave. Verse 9. Chapter 27, verse 9. So do not listen to your prophets, your diviners, your dreamers, your fortune tellers, or your sorcerers who are saying to you, you shall not serve the king of Babylon, for it is a lie they are prophesying to you. Look at verse 14, 27, 14. Do not listen to the words of the prophets who are saying to you, you shall not serve the king of Babylon, for it is a lie they are prophesying to you. Chapter 27, verse 16. Then I spoke to the priests and to all this people saying, Thus says the Lord, Do not listen to the words of your prophets who are prophesying to you, saying, Behold, the vessels of the Lord's house will now shortly be brought back from Babylon, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you. Verse 17. Do not listen to them. Serve the king of Babylon and live. That's the message from God. What's the message from God? Nebuchadnezzar nature is my servant, says God. He is my servant because I am using him to punish this nation. The only way for this nation to live is serve the king of Babylon and you will what? Live. If you resist, if you rebel under the rod of God, if you try to avoid the rod of God, it is going to be pathetic for you. The only way for you now is the rod of God will be heavy upon you. But you have to stay under the rod of God. Then Jeremiah also warned, but many prophets will come and tell you, Babylon will do nothing. Nebuchadnezzar will do nothing. They are all lying. Do not listen. The very next chapter, you have Hananiah. The messenger of God appears with a lying tongue. In every way, the message is against what Jeremiah spoke. Look at chapter 28, verse 1 onwards. In that same year, at the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fifth month of the fourth year, Hananiah, the son of Azur, the prophet from Gibeon, spoke to me in the house of the Lord in the presence of the priests and all the people saying, that to me is almost like, just telling like, you know, lying prophets and lying preachers also will be on the same church in the same pulpit. They have the same context. They speak to the same Christians. I love the word it, way it is put. Here is Hananiah in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priest and all the people. Same context, same place, same audience. But a different message. Verse 2. Even the phrase is the same. Jeremiah said, thus says the Lord. Hananiah also says what? Thus says the Lord. Look at verse 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Wow. What did Jeremiah say? The yoke is upon you. And what is Hananiah saying? I have broken the yoke of whom? The king of Babylon. Verse 3. Within two years... I will bring back to this place all the vessels of the Lord's house, which Nebuchadnezzar, nature, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried to Babylon. I will also bring back to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and all the exiles from Judah who went to Babylon, declares the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. In chapter 27, the message of God was, I will not break the yoke of king of Babylon. The Babylon was a yoke that God has placed on you. Serve Nebuchadnezzar nature and live. Don't resist the discipline of God. Don't resist the rod of God. You better be under the rod of God. And here in the 28th chapter, Hananiah, the messenger of God, 
in the temple of God, in the presence of the priests of God, in the presence of the people of God, gives a different message. I will break the yoke of Babylon. Now it is up to the people to choose what they want to choose. And God's people all across the centuries have always chosen what they want to choose. To stay under the yoke of Babylon is a tough message. But the message that the yoke of Babylon is broken is a beautiful message. But theologically, brothers and sisters, what is going on here is this. In the 27th chapter, Jeremiah's, the, 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 the theme of Jeremiah's message was this. Sin is serious. But in 28th chapter, the theme of Hananiah's message is sin is not serious. In the 27th chapter, the message of Jeremiah was God's punishment is severe. The 28th chapter, the message of Hananiah was God's punishment is momentary and light. In the 27th chapter, Jeremiah's message was don't dribble against the rod of God's discipline. In 28th chapter, the message of Hananiah was play with the discipline of God. Don't worry. Whatever Nebuchadnezzar took two years ago, I will bring it back. Hananiah, the messenger with a lying tongue, is downplaying the seriousness of sin. He's downplaying the judgment of God. He's down, he downplaying the spiritual well-being and the life of the people. By giving the nation what they exactly want to hear. Notice verse 10 onwards. When messengers with lying tongues become so powerful, what can the true messengers do? Look at verse 10 onwards. Chapter 28 verse 10. Then the prophet Hananiah took the yoke bars from the neck of Jeremiah the prophet and broke them. You see that? So it's like, uh, let's imagine like this, one day as Jeremiah was still walking with that wooden yoke on his shoulders across the streets of Jerusalem, telling the nation that the yoke is placed upon you, you cannot escape it, don't rebel against it. And one day as Jeremiah was walking with the yoke on the streets, here comes Hananiah. And Hananiah was irritated by this fellow Jeremiah. He goes to Jeremiah, takes the wooden yoke from his shoulder and breaks it down. And notice the last part of verse 11. But Jeremiah the prophet went on his way. And this has always been the state of the messengers of God in a world of messengers with lying tongues. They are often very powerful. They can take tide of people along with them. And often messengers of truth can't even resist them, fight with them. They can't stand against them. Even today, many of the messengers of truth just walk their way and go. Here is the man of God who ministered in this nation for 54 long years. Couldn't really resist this man because people are already with Hananiah. Hananiah has the support of the nation. Jeremiah is now an isolated individual whom the nation actually hates. And the verse ends by saying, but Jeremiah the prophet went his way. And now God is speaking to Jeremiah. Look at verse 13. Chapter 28 of Jeremiah verse 13. Go tell Hananiah. Thus says the Lord. You have broken wooden bars. But you have made in their place bars of iron.
few years ago when i was teaching the book of jeremiah in the wednesday evening bible study of course i had a different approach to this chapter i did mention i remember at that time when god places a wooden yoke upon us and if we resist the wooden yoke god might return what iron yoke in that place now wooden yokes are not easy either they are tough also it is not easy they are heavy they are tough but when god places the wooden yoke on our shoulders and we resist the wooden yoke we probably are asking for an iron yoke in return and which will be much more difficult today i don't have those applications i remember that wednesday night i was saying that yes god's instruction for young people us looking for a life partner that a believer cannot be equally yoked with an unbeliever means that we cannot go with our whims and our wants when it comes to making a choice for a marriage there is the need for waiting prayer godly counsel sometimes saying no these are wooden yoke that we are not able to decide like our colleagues are desiring or our your friends are desiring that's a wooden yoke but if you resist the wooden yoke which god has placed for good you try to break that you are asking for an iron yoke for the rest of your life and that will hurt my point here this morning is not to move from jeremiah's side my point is to move from hananiah's side messengers of god with lying tongues promises people to remove the wooden yokes but what they are in fact doing is they are placing iron yoke on the shoulders of god's people they promise the people of god that they can remove even the wooden yokes they even do magics of breaking the wooden yoke and make everything light for the people of god but in doing so they are actually placing iron yoke on the shoulders of god's people hananiahs are not dead hananiahs are still available all across the christian world they appear the moment you tune in to that television channel they are right before your face a hananiah they appear the moment you click that youtube channel they are right before you the hananiah they are popular you like them you love to listen to them because they promise to remove the wooden yoke that you really don't want they make things easy they make things super exciting they throw promises after promises for you and probably right from the morning till you go to the bed in your bedroom that 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 the television channel is going on and on and on and on and on as the lie after lie after lie after lie is bombarded in your ears what you are actually running into is an iron yoke this is going to be very tough hananiahs are still alive hananiahs are still alive in the christian world on the pulpits inside a church in the name of god speaking thus says the lord but everything in a way against hananiahs of modern day believe that god is love but they hide the fact that god is just and holy Hananiah the modern day would say heaven is a super exciting place but they hide to talk about hell Hananiah of the modern day still don't play sin they don't play judgment they tell people all is well they tell people that we have behavioral disorders but not sin 
They do not emphasize the importance of holy living, but emphasize giving to church and giving, doing good to others. These are our Hananias. They are all around us. They promised the removal of wooden yoke, but placed the iron yoke on the shoulders of God's people. The question is, what is their methodology? People's faces may change. Their dressing may change. The mediums through which they appear may change. But the methodology stays the same across the centuries. It was the Hananiah's methodology, the same methodology even today. It is outrightly twisting the word of God. The 27th chapter was quite plain. The yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, submit under the yoke and live. Sin deserves punishment. When punishment comes, submit to the punishment. If you submit to the punishment, then you will have a chance. But if you resist and rebel, you will not live. That was the message of Jeremiah in the 27th chapter. It was twisting the very message was the message of Hananiah. The methodology is still the same. It is twisting the word of God. That these Hananiahs of our, modern, of our modern time, whom we call as the prosperity gospel preachers or the health and wealth gospel preachers, they are all around us whose name we don't have to mention from this pulpit this morning. They are everywhere. The prosperity gospel preachers, the health and wealth preachers, they still have the same Hananiah's methodology Twisting the word and thereby placing iron bars on the people's shoulders. They will have a big crowd. Their asset will be 780 US dollars, 780 million US dollars. They increase and increase and increase while their people are writhing under iron bars. What I want to do for the rest of the time this morning is this. Because this has been an increasing problem in the Christian circle. That people sometimes get exposed to churches like this. Churches where Hananiah kind of ministry goes on. They get exposed to churches like that for a long time. And uh, in churches like that, under ministries like that, there is always a honeymoon period guaranteed. You will have that period. When all will go well. And what's almost like whatever they are saying, you know, wealth is there, health is there, money is multiplying, everything is going on, and you will be in a cloud nine phase. And you will be passionate about church, passionate about Bible, passionate about God, and everything. But then a turn can happen in life. Maybe a sickness, maybe a financial crisis, or maybe a sickness that cannot be healed, something like that. Then the reality strikes in. And people begin to wonder what's going on. Faith goes down. Love for God goes cold. Doubts begin to appear. Then slowly people will change the church also maybe. But then they still take all those verses that has been foolishly quoted in the previous church are still in their heart and mind. Why is not God doing? Why is God not doing that? Why is God, God no, why is why, why not God fulfilling that promise? Why not God doing that? Ultimately all the blame is on God. And that's where the road always goes. And this is a huge problem in the Christian world. And these are people who once upon a time was like on fire for God. And then suddenly something happens. Everything goes for a downward spiral. It's gone. But their Hananiahs, 
still are doing a wonderful life as their people carry the iron bar and go everywhere not knowing what to do what i want to do for the next few minutes here this morning is to take you to through six important verses in the bible three in the old testament and three in the new testament the tools of modern days hananias that these are commonly the six passages that today's hananias could be man or a woman it doesn't matter that today's preachers with the spirit of hananiah on your television screen on your youtube channel this is what the verses they will take and quote and this is how they will twist the word and fool you and divert you from faith or cause you to believe the wrong things the modern days hananias i am not saying these are the only six but these are the popular six verses in the bible the spirit of hananiah today works in the christian world in the context of church and you need to be aware of that or if somebody quotes that to you you need to be able to explain what the meaning of that is because as i told people's dressing may change their appearance may change but the methodology is the satanic methodology satanic methodology is the same across the centuries and even today the health and wealth gospel preachers have the same satanic methodology the spirit of hanania is actively at through or through the health and wealth preachers and the uh, and the prosperity gospel preachers and these are the six common verses that they will take i want you to take through the six verses and what will let you know how they twist these verses and how you are to understand those verses that you will not succumb to the promises of breaking the wooden yoke and invite upon you the harshness of the iron yoke the first verse that modern hananias messengers of god with lying tongues will dare to touch is a verse from the book of jeremiah itself and this verse is known to be for i think now five consecutive years the most shared verse in the entire bible on social media platforms and the most loved verse by christians across the globe from the book of jeremiah itself jeremiah chapter 29 the very next chapter verse 11 is known to be the most loved verse among the christians across the globe the most shared verse on social media platforms across the globe for more than 5 years is jeremiah 29 11 many of you may quote that from your memory now what is that i know the plans i have for you plans to prosper plans to give you a good future no wonder it is the most loved verse in the entire bible let's turn there Jeremiah 29 verse 11 one of the important tools in the preachers of the Hananiah spirit today for i know the plans i have for you declares the lord plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope the first thing to learn about this verse is this verse in the bible is never personal it is national it is not personal verse at all it is a verse that is given in the context of nation not in the context of person that is extremely important so i am not saying there are no personal applications in this verse all god's words do have personal application for all ages and time no doubt about it but that doesn't mean that you can take a verse that is given in a national context and immediately convert that into a personal verse as the health and go- wealth gospel preachers will speak you know plan for you your welfare it's like me and you it's god and you god and you no it's not god and you it's god and the nation 
That's what Jeremiah 29 is all about. In the year 597 BC, Nebuchadnezzar came as Jeremiah prophesied in the 27th chapter of Jeremiah. Nebuchadnezzar came. He took some of the wonderful men, even godly men, as captive to Babylon. Daniel went. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego went. All these men were part of that captivity. People who ended up in Babylon. The question is this. Why even the righteous men are suffering the punishment of God? Why even godly men are suffering the punishment of God? How do the righteous people respond to the Babylonian captivity? You know what? Jewish people ordinarily, ordinarily respond to an enemy attack by means of something called imprecatory prayers. Ever heard about it? Imprecatory prayers. Imprecatory prayers means putting curse upon your enemy, seeking your enemy's downfall. May you know, may his generation be childless. May curse be upon them. This is called imprecatory prayers. A natural tendency for a Babylonian attack like that is to sit and put curse on whom? Babylon. Look at chapter 29 of Jeremiah, the very chapter, chapter 29 of Jeremiah. Look at verse 4 onwards. Verse 4 onwards. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may have sons and daughters multiply there and do not decrease. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare you will find your welfare. God is telling them, when you reach Babylon, don't sit and curse them. Because I have punished you and sent you where? To Babylon. When you go to Babylon, take care of your life in a normal manner. Settle down there. Plant, reap, eat, get married, have sons and daughters. And more so, seek the welfare of what? The Babylonian city. Because if Babylon is going down, your life will go down. Seek the welfare of the city. Don't sit and pray imprecatory prayers. Now, that is very tough for me to accept. As a Jew, that's one of the most toughest things for me to accept. To go to an enemy state, nation and sit there and pray for the well-being of that city. So God tells that captivity in generation. You take care of your life in a normal manner. Your future, I will take care of. For this generation will be there in Babylon only for 70 years. After 70 years, God knows what to do. But the point is this. Close to 90% of people who heard this prophecy, Jeremiah 29.11, never lived to see the fulfillment of this prophecy. Except for few people, like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were teenagers when they were captivated. So they must have lived to see the return. But more than 90% of people who heard the words of Jeremiah 29:11 never lived to see the fulfillment of this prophecy. Which means their life was harsh, their life was tough, they lived under the difficult situation of Babylon there, and they never experienced prosperity, they never saw that well-being, their generation will, but they themselves did not. And that's the reason I said Jeremiah 29.11 was never a personal prophecy, it was a national prophecy, connected to the Abrahamic covenant. God will cause these people to return from Babylon 
back to Jerusalem. Until such a time, you will live in this harshness of Babylon. Live in the unfriendly climate of Babylon. Pray for the well-being of Babylon. Have your normal life and activities going on there. But as you live under the harsh conditions of Babylon, trust in the goodness of God. Trust that God's judgment does not mean God abandoned his people. God knows how to fulfill his plans and purposes. That part has an application for us even today. It is not to say that today morning at 6 o'clock I got up and planned for well-being at 10 o'clock. Planned for Nonsense. R rubbish. But, it, but, but Jeremiah 29, 11 has a beautiful application. No matter how harsh the situation that you are going through today, no matter how tough it is, no matter how unfavorable circumstances that you are fighting and battling today, trust that the one who called you is faithful. God has good plans and purposes for you. You can trust God. Even if you are going through the disciplining hands of God today, you can still trust God's discipline does not mean God abandoning you. You can stay under the disciplining hands of God. But Jeremiah 29.11 is not about bank balance increasing or job promotion getting done and everybody in the home not having viral fever or dengue or anything. That is not what it is. It is a national promise. And today we can say it is a promise that is applicable for the people of God at large. But not for every single individual alone. No. But for the people of God at large, it is a promise. I think Romans 8.28 is the New Testament side of Jeremiah 29.11. All things works for good. And what is the good? If you have been called, you are justified. If you are justified, you are glorified. And you will be one day confirmed to the image and likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether sickness or health, loss or gain, business success or business failure, promotion or denial of promotion, one day you will be confirmed to the image and the likeness of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. No force on earth can stop that. Jeremiah 29.11 is the most powerful tool in the hands of the satanic Hananiah preachers today. Know what that promise means. It is not as they convert it to be. The second verse in the Old Testament. A very, very, very popular verse. And this verse is basically by all the miracle crusaders. Healing crusaders. These people. For them. This is a very, very popular verse. Some of you must have guessed Isaiah 53, 5. By his wounds we are healed. Right? A very, very popular verse in the hands of the modern day Hananias. Isaiah 53, 5. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. Again without naming anyone here. I am quoting a popular modern day Hananiah. A popular preaching with the satanic Hananiah spirit today. Very popular across the globe. And I am sure majority of you must have heard him at least once. And his comment on Isaiah 53 verse 5. And I quote. It is the plan of our father God. In his great love and in his great mercy. That no believer should ever be sick. That every believer should live his life full span. Down here on his earth. Praise be to God. For Isaiah 53 verse 5. The voice of Hananiah is not dead. It is alive. Here he is. And sometimes I don't blame people. Sometimes it is ignorance. Not preachers like this. These are guys who commit sin with knowledge. 
but sometimes people who follow them can i i've seen in hospitals uh people praying for someone in the sick bed in the hospitals they pray like lord i pray for so and so uh, i pray that for he has been already healed by your wounds oh, little difficult to pray because you are really gambling a lot because t- tomorrow if the movies from the water the icu are in little trouble one of the important argument in isaiah 53:5 is the past tense of that verse right by his wounds we are healed ed that is what past so that is the important there lies the crux we are healed his wounds how do we understand isaiah 53:5 Well one of the important tools for us to understand Isaiah 53:5 is thankfully apostle Peter quotes that verse in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 24 so there is one clue for us to understand Isaiah 53:5 i will come there later on apostle Peter quotes Isaiah 53:5 in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 24 but before i arrive there let me give three important observations or things that you have to keep in mind when we try to understand the meaning of Isaiah 53:5 number 1 is a grammatical information i want to give you grammatical information what is the grammatical information listen to me many past tense in the bible does not function the way we understand the past tense from a grammatical framework because many past tenses in the bible are called as theological past tenses that works slightly different from the way a general past tense in a grammatical framework understands for example i will show you show you a quick example turn in your bibles to the well known verse romans chapter 8 romans chapter 8 turn in your bibles for a moment there to romans 8 verse 28 onwards we all know that passage right romans chapter 8 reading from verse 28 onwards and we know that for those who love god all things work together for good for those who have been called according to his purpose for those whom he foreknew he also predestined to be confirmed to the image of the likeness of his son verse 30 and those whom he predestined he also called and those whom he called he also justified and those whom he justified he also what glorified so let's now say justified past or present ha huh? past do you have any problem with that no problem are you justified yes but then you have the next one glorified past or present Raise your hands. How many of you are glorified now here? <laughs> no. We are waiting for glorification. When we shall see him face to face, that will be the glorification. So glorified in Romans chapter 8 verse 8. verse 30 is a theological past what's a theological past a theological past is a past tense in the bible that tells us from god's point of view the action is over but from the experience point of view it is still waiting a future fulfillment that is called a theological past tense from god's point of view the action is accomplished it is done but from an experiential point of view it is still awaiting a future presence so yes if you are a justified person if you are a saved person from god's point of view it is as good as you are glorified that's called the eternal security of believers from god's point of view you are secure forever but from your experience and my experience point of view glorification is still waiting a future fulfillment so glorified in romans 28:30 is not is a theological past what slightly different from the way it works in a grammatical framework so coming back to isaiah 55:3 there is a chance 
that Isaiah 55, 3 could be a theological past. A theological past in the sense, something that is over from God's point of view. Because of what Jesus has done on the cross for us. But from an experiential point of view, from believer's side, it is still awaiting a future fulfillment. Getting it? That is number one, the grammatical side. The second one is contextual. The contextual side of understanding Isaiah 55, 50, 55, 3. I'm sorry, I'm 53. 53, 53, 5. I'm sorry. Thanks for the correction. I say 53, 5. The contextual point. I already told you, Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, quotes Isaiah 53, 5. Correct? So let's go there. Have your fingers in one finger. You have it in Isaiah 55, 53, 5. You have one finger in Isaiah 53, 5. And then also turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2, where Peter quotes that verse. 1 Peter chapter 2. Let's see. Chapter 2, verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Right? Well, look at 1 Peter 2.24 and also Isaiah 53.5. I am going to read that for you. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Both in Isaiah 53 and Peter quoting that in 1 Peter chapter 2, does not have physical sickness in anywhere in the context. In Isaiah 53, it is transgressions, iniquities. In 1 Peter chapter 2, it is what? Sin. Transgressions, iniquity, sin forms the context of the word you are what? Healed. By his wounds you are healed. The physical sickness is never to be seen there at all. Transgressions, iniquities, sin. And then it says, by his wounds you are healed. And therefore, contextually, the term healed must be connected to sin, transgressions, and iniquities. Because physical sickness is never seen there. We are moving to the third one. The third one is an etymological reason. What is etymology? Etymology is simply to study the word. The word healed in Isaiah 53.5 is a very popular Hebrew word, many of you must be knowing this Hebrew word called Rafa. Have you ever heard people saying Yehovah Rafa? Right? Yehovah Rafa, Yehovah Rafa. These days we have thousand ways to praise God. So this Yehovah Rafa, Yehovah Shalom, everybody knows that. Yehovah Rafa means God who heals. That's the word. This word Rafa comes 60 times in the Old Testament. And majority of the 60 times, this word is in reference to physical healing. Now that creates a problem for us. Because majority of the 60 times, whenever this word Rafa appears in the Old Testament, it is in reference to what? Physical healing. But on the other side, it is not always in reference to physical healing also. For example, in 2 Kings, in 1 Kings chapter 18, in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 30, this same word Rafa is translated as repair. You remember, in Mount Carmel, Elijah was in contest with this 
prophets of Baal and they cried to Baal, Baal, answer us, answer us, nothing happened. They were dancing, doing all sort of kind of things. And when evening came, Elijah said, okay, you all guys go at that side. I want to use this altar. So he come up with an altar and then it says, he repaired the altar. The word is, he rafa the altar. He repaired the altar. The word simply means to put in order something that is out of order. That's all. Not necessarily physical healing. To put in order something that is out of order. So Jeremiah, sorry, Elijah, Rafa, healed the altar. The English Bible will say, repaired the altar. So if somebody says the word Rafa only must refer to physical healing, no, that's not right. Because the word is translated in other ways also in the Old Testament. But if someone says, but majority of the time the word Rafa is translated as physical healing, we have to say, yeah, yes. Then somebody can ask us, then why can't Isaiah 53, 5 is in reference to physical healing? Here is where I would say, Isaiah 53, 5 could have a dual emphasis. In the immediate context, the emphasis is clearly spiritual. Transgressions, iniquities, sins. No doubt about that. In the immediate context, the emphasis is clearly spiritual, not physical. But at the same time, we cannot deny a physical element in it because the word Rafa, majority of the time, is in relation to physical healing. So if there is a physical healing dimension to Isaiah 53.5, it's a theological past, which means because Christ died for us, our physical wholesomeness is guaranteed by Christ on the cross, but it is awaiting a future fulfillment as we read in Revelation chapter 21 verse 4, no more sickness, no more pain, no more sorrows. We are awaiting. We are awaiting not because a utopian hope. We are awaiting because Christ has sealed it. It is over. Yes, as long as we live in this body of sin, we struggle with sin. We go through sin just as unbelievers can have sickness, believers have sickness. They are hospitalized, we can be hospitalized. They die, we die. But the promise is this. There is going to come a time we'll be set free from all these things. It can have a dual emphasis. But if it is in reference to physical healing also, then the healed is a theological past tense. Secured in Christ, but waiting a future fulfillment. But no preacher can take that verse and say, Christ, by his own you are healed and you must be healed. You must be healed tomorrow. You will not progress into, you will not deteriorate. No, 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 no. That is not guaranteed by Isaiah 53, 5 at all. First and foremost, it is spiritual. That our transgressions and iniquities and sins are healed through the sacrifice of Christ. And if there is a physical emphasis there, it is something we are still waiting for because of what Christ has done for us on the cross. The third verse that I want to let you know this morning is we move from Jeremiah 29, 11, Isaiah 53, 5, and the third verse. Most common verse in the hands of the prosperity gospel preachers, the miracle crusade workers and all these things is Psalm 91.10. What is that? No evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague shall come near your tent. Right? Psalm 91 verse 10. No evil shall be allowed to befall you, and no plague shall come near your tent. And I have seen pastors opening to Psalm 91 and staying beside a hospitalized person and reading that. The irony is the evil is already there. And then you say, no evil shall fall upon you. 
somewhere it is contradicting of course if you understand the meaning and read no problem it can be read in a hospital also no no problem with that but the prosperity gospel preachers and the miracle workers taking isaiah 21 91 10 and telling no evil shall come upon you no plague shall enter your tent what psalm 91 10 means again the nature of psalms many of the psalms psalms are nationalistic hymns they are not personal many psalms are not personal few are majority of the psalms are again in the context of nation it's the nation's hymn book it is not a person's hymn book it's a nation's hymn book in the old testament covenant framework many of the national plagues and evil are a sign of god's direct judgment on the nation because the nation somewhere is disobeying the covenant stipulations of god and when covenant stipulations are disobeyed god deals with the nation and plagues and evil uh, evil uh, either in the form of a nation wide sickness or in the form of a, um, a military attack from the enemy or whatever evil it is they are god's sign of judgment psalm 9110 in short is not promising that you will not go through a viral fever or a gastritic problem or a, that is not what psalm 9110 is promising what psalm 9210 promises is this if you are a child of god living in obedience to god even if you go through a evil or a sickness or anything you can be rest assured they are not judgments of god upon you god is not judging you it could be a sickness it could be a evil it could be a harm but you can be assured it is not god punishing you it is not god's judgment upon you that is what is promised in psalm 9110 it is not a blanket promise that no evil in any way come near you or no plague will come at all yes for the psalmist it is a confidence that if you are dwelling in the shadow of the almighty in the old testament language that means living in obedience to god's law and all the stipulations of law if you live a life like that then you can be rest assured that none of these things ever indicate god is punishing or god is judging you can be assured of that that is assured but not the absence of sickness and diseases is assured by psalm 91 10 in any way the next one we are moving to new testament a very popular verse in the hands of modern day hananias with the lying tongues matthew's gospel chapter 7 verse 7 some of you may be able to quote that what's the verse ask and it shall be given unto you seek and you shall find knock and the door shall be opened to you so if you don't have a mercedes you are not asking for it if you don't have a palatial bungalow you are not knocking after it if you knock and ask and seek you will get either jesus must be a liar or you are a liar who is a liar jesus can't be he said ask and you will get so you keep asking 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 and many are asking and dying also what does this verse mean chapter 7 of matthew's gospel is part of what sermon on the mount that begins in which chapter chapter 5 right So let's take two things here first of all the immediate context then the larger context first let us see the immediate context and try to understand what is this asking means the immediate context is there in verse 1 on, 1 onwards chapter 7 verse 1 judge not that you will not be judged for with the judgment you pronounce you will be judged and with the measure you use to measure it will be given to you Why do you see the speck in your brother's eyes but do not notice the log that is in your own eye or how can you say to your brother let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye you hypocrite 
First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Church, brothers and sisters, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, verse 7, is a wonderful asking we all have to do. That is, ask God that you will see the log in your own eye, first of all. Rather than seeing the speck in others' eyes. Lord, open my eyes that when I go to the church, when I mingle with God's people, that we can often get busy in looking at the speck in everybody else's life. As if we are all doctors who come to the uh, uh, church for the spiritual healing of everybody. Right? And we can go from the church completely missing the log in our eyes. If you have to really practice ma Matthew chapter 7, 7, every day ask God, Lord, help me to see the log in my own eyes first of all. Then you are obeying Matthew's gospel, chapter 7, verse 7. It is not asking God for all nonsense. That is not what Matthew 7, 7 is. Lord, help me to see my own problems. Lord, help me to see my own faults. Help me to see my own logs in my eyes before I spend time in seeing the speck in others' eyes. That is what Matthew 7, 7 means in the immediate context. And Matthew 7, 7 in the larger context means... Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Ask that God will give you the poverty of the spirit. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Ask God that you will have that pure heart. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Ask God that you will have the meekness and not pride. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Ask God that you can be that salt. You can be the light. These are the things that you are supposed to ask. Not for promotions and bank balances and three cars and four cars and a four BHK and a four BHK to eight BHK. These are not what you are supposed to ask. The immediate context, the ability to see the log in your own eyes, the larger context, everything that Jesus said in the previous verses, starting from the Beatitudes, you can ask, God will give. But not as the Hananias of a modern day preachers will tell you. No, that's not what it is. The fifth verse in the line is James chapter 4 verse 2. James chapter 4 verse 2, another popular verse in the hands of the modern day Hananias with the lying tongues. James 4, 2. James chapter 4, verse 2. You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And I am yet to hear, I am yet to hear a modern day satanic lying prosperity gospel preacher I am yet to hear a preacher quoting that verse fully. They carefully quote only the last line of the verse. Very smartly avoiding the previous lines. The last line alone. What is the line? You do not have because you do not ask. So you can just take a plain paper and write now what are the things that you actually don't have. In life, you wish to have, but you don't have. Okay? I wonder whether one sheet is enough or not. And you can have a very easy conclusion for that. You don't have because you don't ask. So what you're supposed to do? Yeah, ask those satanic fellows. They will tell you how to ask. The modern day Hananias. Look at the very next verse that shuts the mouth of all these false preachers and modern day Hananias. Look at the very next verse. Verse 3. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. So at least it is clear the asking in verse 2 has nothing to do with asking anything to satisfy my own desires or passions. Because James says, you are asking because you want to satisfy your own pleasures and your own desires. That's exactly what these teachers are asking us to do. 
you just ask god anything that you want and you desire and one one guy said a very popular book i'm again i'm not going to mention the book or anything in which he gives an illustration that he wanted a bicycle when he was in a, a particular part of the world and he first asked god for a bicycle and then he the bicycle did not come so then he realized the mistake he did not tell the brand of the bicycle to god so then he started the brand of the bicycle then he didn't get that so he again realized his mistake mistake he didn't tell the color of the bicycle to god so so he then started praying to god the brand of the bicycle and the color of the bicycle and um, he didn't get that then he realized his mistake he didn't say the showroom from where the bicycle is to come so he started praying the brand of the bicycle the color of the bicycle and the showroom from where the bicycle should come when he get to that specific with god the bicycle came rubbish fooling god making god a pony in your hands the very next verse says at least the asking in verse 2 does not mean asking my wants and my desires and everything that's not what it is so what is this you have not because you ask not all the context is the answer look at verse one onwards what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you is it not this that your passions are at war within you you desire and you do not have so you murder you covet and cannot obtain so you fight and quarrel you do not have because you do not ask the asking god here church has to do with contentment in life the amazing beautiful sense of godly contentment that's what the previous verse is about you don't have you envy others you covet and you go and commit murder it's all because you don't you are not asking god for the sense of contentment church little is enough little is not always the lack of god's hands what you have to ask is rather than envying and murdering the other person who have ask god for contentment that is what you are supposed to ask for it is not for the bicycle and the brand of the bicycle or the bike and the brand of the bike and the color of the bike and the showroom of the bike no lord even if i don't have that bike give me that sense of contentment that is what james 4 2 is all about not asking for what you want and what you desire and finally this is the pinnacle of all john's gospel chapter 14 verse 14 john 14 14 what does it says you may ask me for anything in my name and i will give it john's gospel 14 14 you may ask me anything in my name and i will do it so the anything must be anything isn't it now imagine if my son fails in a particular subject comes home disappointed and uh, he has his report card failed in that subject very sad so i am sitting with my son and i am telling him hey don't worry no you can study no the subject matter is academics he failed the report card is there dad is speaking to him the context is still academics and i am telling him and i am encouraging him and telling matthew you ask me anything i will support you in this regard he can't go and say ah oh, i need hayabusa any common sense man will say the subject matter is academics studies a failed report card that's what that is anything to support has to do with what academics 
any support with related to studies or help him to improve with his studies but he does he need a tuition or something else your daddy will do anything he can immediately take the anything and ask for all nonsense here and there i want that i want this i want that that i want this son academics studies that's the context anything functions in that framework so john 14 14 is one such anything it is not anything as these fellows are doing it is one such anything and the context here is missions evangelism the propagation of the gospel let's look at john's gospel chapter 14 verse 14 john 14 14 and let's read from verse 12 onwards truly truly i say to you whoever believes in me will also do the works that i do and greater works than these will he do because i am going to the father whatever you ask in my name this i will do that the father may be glorified in the son if you ask me anything in my name i will do it so what is this asking anything well asking anything for the sake of fulfilling what you read in verse 12 greater works than these will he do because i am going to the father what is this greater works that the disciples are going to do that surpasses the works of the lord jesus christ well jesus talked about that in acts chapter 1 verse 8 the spirit of god will the holy spirit will come you shall be my witnesses in jerusalem in judea samaria and to the ends of the earth jesus christ did not breach the boundaries of the land of israel his ministry was limited to the boundaries of the land of israel and here comes his disciples they carry the gospel step outside the boundaries of israel here comes apostle paul travels 3000 miles cr- crisscrossing asia and europe carrying the gospel greater works than me you guys will do time is going to come because i am going back to the father which means the spirit will descend the church will begin you guys will carry the gospel and do greater things than i have ever accomplished for that sake ask anything that you need you will get it and the immediate next verse verse 15 if you love me you will keep my commandments ask anything to me for that to love me and to obey my commandments what support you need what help you need you ask me anything i will give i will give you every support to love me i will give you every resource that you will walk in obedience to me for that sake ask anything i will give not as the spirit of hananiah today speaks because john 14 14 says ask anything just go and ask anything no brothers and sisters to carry the gospel of the lord jesus christ into your neighborhood among your colleagues or to fulfill the great commission of the lord jesus christ what support do you need as god to love the lord your god with all your heart and mind and soul what support you need ask god to obey him all his commandments what support you need ask god he will give but the voice of hananiah today are different they twist these words they tweak these words they misinterpret they misapply and i have been and this church has heard this many times from me doctrines affect behavior if doctrines go wrong behavior go wrong and that is why in churches like this where people are sitting under the teaching and preaching ministries of such kind of people they always have this kind of a cloud nine spiritual face and everything is all right but when suddenly something crumbles physically or in finance or in business or something and for them everything is gone wrong and finally what is god doing why is god no, not keeping his word why is god not fulfilling the promise 
It is, not, it is not God not keeping his words. It is not God not fulfilling his promise. It is you have terribly misunderstood his word and you have misapplied it. And therefore your behavior is terribly going wrong. It's not God's problem. It's your problem. May I close with this one word as we meditated upon this man, Hananiah. A man who twisted the words of Jeremiah. Outrightly lying. But he got people with him. To the extent even the man of God, Jeremiah, have to walk out silently. If we have to avoid Lying tongues. The damages it can do for our spiritual life. Then here is a counsel. Do not give your ears to too many tongues for spiritual feeding. Do not give your ears for too many tongues for spiritual feeding. That's the counsel I give you. If you have a home with a wonderful mother or a wife or a family that is making the best food for you and catering for you, making sure it is qualitative, it is having all the essential nutrition and with love it's been served, you must be a fool to hop around to different houses to taste all kinds of food there or to be sold out for all the restaurants in the city. You are first of all going ungrateful for the house that you have, for the home that you have, for the family that you have. If you have to keep yourself from the dangers of the lying tongues and the, and the disastrous effects that you can create for your spiritual life, then take this counsel, please. Do not give your ears to too many tongues for spiritual feeding. That will spoil your health. That will confuse you. It will spoil your taste buds. Don't. The danger is so high because of the digital era in which we live. The danger is so high because of the social media era in which we live. Forwards and forwards and forwards are unending forwards. And you have two minutes clip and five minutes clips and ten minutes clips are so easily that you can watch. So exciting. People are thoroughly confused. The reason is you are not satisfied with the home that serves a quality food with love and care. By losing everything for the restaurants you are hopping around and the other houses that you are hopping around. Stop that for God's sake. And the prominent lie that is going around in the world today is Sin is not serious. God tolerates sin. All that you have to do is be a good fellow, good boy, good girl. Read your Bible every day, pray. Give your money to the church, give your money to pastors. Be good, behave good. That will be great. That is a lying tongue that is going around in the Christian world today. The truth of the gospel is sin is serious. God takes sin very seriously. Sin is very serious to the extent that it cost the life of the precious Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Who died on the cross on behalf of you to forgive you from your sins. Your sin is not light. You cannot handle by yourself. And you cannot cover it up by your money or giving or your tithe or your Bible reading or prayer. 
There's only one solution for that sin. Come to the Savior. Come to the Savior as a sinner. Come to the cross. Believe that He died in your place on the cross. And tell, oh Jesus, I am that sinner. And you in my place, forgive me. And you can become a child of God. Then comes all your Bible reading and prayer and giving to the church and all those things. Become a child of God by putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And maybe a few others must hear this morning. If the Lord has put a wooden yoke on your shoulders, whatever that wooden yoke may be, it may be the wooden yoke of standing as a testimony in the midst of the tough situation at home. It may be a wooden yoke of obeying the commandment of God for which you have to cut off certain relationship. It may be a wooden yoke of uh, honoring God in the midst of a very difficult situation. It may be a wooden yoke of saying no to a particular proposal that is so close to you, but you know there is some disobedience involved. If God has put a wooden yoke on you, do not resist the wooden yoke of God. Stay under. Because in resisting, you are inviting an iron yoke which can be much harsher. And if it is a wooden yoke of God's discipline, do not rebel. The way out is repentance, confession, forgiveness. That's the way out. It is not rebelling. It is not resisting. May God spare us from the tongues and the spirits of Ananias. May God help us to heed the voice of the Jeremiah, even if it is tough, even if it is difficult. May God enable us to stay under the wooden yoke, obediently, that we would not invite iron yoke on ourselves. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for your word. Times have changed, but the problems persist. We still live in a world that is full of the voice of the Hananias all around us. With the Bible on the pulpits, inside the church, among the people of God, in the presence of the pastors. Even saying, thus says the Lord, but the lying spirit. For God spare us, spare Bethany Baptist Church and everyone who worships here from the power and the effects of such lying tongues. The way they twist the word of God, misinterpret the word, and help us to understand doctrines do affect our behavior. That if we go wrong with what we believe, we will go wrong in how we behave. Help us, Lord, to understand your word that we might respond to these kind of lying voices around us, that we might even able to warn others and teach others and help us, O oh Father, to pay attention to the counsel that we would not give our ears to too many tongues when it comes to spiritual feeding. The home that you have blessed us with, the catering of the spiritual meal that you give us. Help us to be content with that. We pray, O oh God, if there is someone here who is carrying a wooden yoke, whatever that yoke may be, help the person, Lord, to stay under that yoke instead of trying to break them down. And if there is someone here, O oh God, need to come as a sinner to a Savior, Draw that person to the Savior, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.